In my last lecture, I reviewed the dramatic increase in the U.S. prison population over the past 30 years. As a result of our efforts to get tough on crime, we now have the highest incarceration rate in the world. Who are these people that we're locking up? The prison population turns out to be disproportionately male, uneducated, and black. Indeed, poverty and race are so tightly intertwined with our expanding prison system that we can't separate the study of imprisonment from the study of poverty and race. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, one in three black men can expect to be sent to prison at some point in their lifetime. Almost 30 percent of the black male population. And in states like California and Illinois, black men are more likely to go to prison than to college. In this lecture, I want to explore the racial disparities in our criminal justice system and to expand on the consequences for our society and for the black community in particular. There are many reasons why young, uneducated black men are disproportionately represented in our criminal justice system. First, due to high rates of unemployment and poverty, these men are more likely to commit crimes. Uh, one estimate suggests that about 80% of the racial disparities in imprisonment are due to higher crime rates among this population. The remaining 20%, however, appears to have something to do with the biases in our criminal justice system. The report by the Sentencing Project, for example, suggests that the 1980s war on drugs led to higher incarceration rates for low-income blacks. In relatively affluent communities, uh, drug abuse was addressed through a combination of prevention and treatment. In low-income communities, it was addressed primarily through policing and incarceration. So blacks who are concentrated in low-income neighborhoods um, constitute 13% of drug users, but represent 33% of those arrested for drug-related offenses. Now there's also huge disparities in the penalties associated with crack cocaine, which is more prevalent in low-income communities, versus powder cocaine, which is more prevalent in more affluent communities. Federal legislation adopted in 1986 and 1988 um, imposed a mandatory five-year prison sentence for much smaller amounts of crack cocaine than powder cocaine. And the effect uh, uh, was that um, blacks who were more likely to use crack cocaine um, were more likely to be imprisoned for drug use than whites who were more likely to use powder cocaine. A related issue is that black men are more likely to be policed than their white counterparts. Racial profiling is a practice in law enforcement in which people are subjected to greater scrutiny due to stereotypes about their race. The practice originated in a program called Operation Pipeline. This was a program started by the Drug Enforcement Agency in 1984. And the program trained police um, how to recognize and, and stop potential drug couriers using certain markers of drug use and criminality. Things like wearing gold jewelry or having fast food wrappers in your car. Um, after Operation Pipeline, it became common for local police agencies to use race as a marker of criminality. But in the 1990s, people began to question this practice. In New Jersey, for example, black motorists began to complain that they were being stopped by police for no other reason than their race, a problem that became known as driving while black. Now, not only was racial profiling incredibly discriminatory, but it proved to be really ineffective. Research suggested that targeting blacks and Latinos did not lead to more drug seizures and that police were more likely to find drugs through routine traffic stops and searches of white drivers. 
So in the late 1990s, um, groups like the NAACP and the ACLU brought lawsuits against law enforcement agencies for targeting minority uh, drivers. And many states passed legislation that effectively banned the use of racial profiling. Racial bias in policing has been a prominent issue in studies of the wrongfully convicted. I had you watch a video about Anthony Robinson, who is a uh, black man who was convicted of rape in Texas in 1986. Robinson was sentenced to 27 years, but due to prison overcrowding, he was released on parole after 10 years. Once he was paroled, Robinson hired an attorney to help prove his innocence because he claimed all along that he was innocent and that he did not commit this crime for which he was sent to prison. DNA evidence proved that he was innocent, uh, that he had not con committed the rape, and he was exonerated in the year 2000. Soon thereafter, he became the poster child for a bill before the Texas legislature that would provide compensation financial compensation for the wrongfully convicted. Not only did Robinson's story help pass this bill in Texas in 2001, but Robinson himself uh, was awarded $25,000 for each year he served as an innocent man. Now one of the more touching parts of this video, in my opinion, is toward the end as we hear Robinson describe his constant fear of being arrested again for a crime that he did not commit. Each day, he explains, he puts on a suit and tie as insurance um, so that he might not draw the attention of the police. This statement speaks volumes about the racial disadvantages suffered by young black men each day in this country. What effect do these trends have on the black community and the larger U.S. population? One of the more troubling impacts is that a criminal record exacerbates the problems of unemployment and poverty for young black men. Because ex-convicts have a hard time finding work, especially good work, serving a prison term reduces one's wages from anywhere to 10 to 30 percent. Interestingly, this disadvantage extends to non-offenders who live in high crime areas. So, if you're a law-abiding black man who happens to live in a high crime neighborhood, you may have just as hard a time finding work as a person with a criminal record. Another disturbing impact is that in certain states, people with a felony conviction can no longer vote in public elections, even after they've served their time and are off parole. This is what we mean by disenfranchisement. It's the denial of voting rights for, for, for certain segments of the population. Though ex-convicts have served their time, their criminal record effectively bars them from democratic participation in certain states. And if you think this is an insignificant impact, consider the fact that 15% of all adult black men in the United States are no longer eligible to vote in U.S. elections. Finally, the disproportionate incarceration of blacks affects their families and communities. One out of every 14 black children has a parent in prison on any given day, and this has devastating impact on their educational attainment and their overall well-being. Today we can say that we've abolished slavery, that we've done away with racist policies and customs, and that we have seen a real decline in racist attitudes. But we can also say that today we now lock up young, uneducated black men in numbers that have never been seen in U.S. history. Today we are more likely to offer a young black man funding as a federal or state prisoner than we are to offer them funding as a college student. Now it's reasonable to expect that a criminal should pay for their crime. But it's also reasonable to think that innocent people shouldn't have to fear racial bias in our criminal justice system. That ex-convicts who have served their time should not have their voting rights denied, and that children shouldn't have to pay for the crimes of their parents. At some point, we must ask ourselves 
whether this is really the best way to fight crime or whether this is really the best way to ensure that an already disadvantaged population remains without hope for the future. Thank you.